Today we start in Psalm 43 and meander through a little personal genealogy. Psalm 43, verse 5. Why art thou downcast, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. In the past two Psalms, 42 and 43, the author has been down in the dumps, feeling removed and remote from the Lord, but he encourages himself that he will continue to hope in Jehovah. Psalm 42 verse 5 expresses this same lament twice. In verse 5, the sons of Korah have written, Why art thou downcast, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. And again in verse 11, Why art thou downcast, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. His countenance is the health of my countenance, as it is written in Second Corinthians 3.18. But we all, with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Twice the author of Psalms refers to his own face and once to Jehovah's face. Since he has been downcast, we can understand that perhaps he is physically looking down due to his circumstances. However, in all the verses, the word translated as health is actually Yeshua, that is, salvation. He is talking about the salvation of his face. Saving face is a concept still widely referenced in Asian countries, although only actually in reverse, that is, losing face. The term to save face means to retain respect or avoid humiliation. We save face when we try to regain favorable standing after something embarrassing has happened, or to give or afford someone else an opportunity to avoid embarrassment, humiliation, or shame. It was originally used by the English community in China with reference to the continual devices used by the Chinese to avoid incurring or inflicting disgrace. The exact phrase, to save face, does not occur in Chinese, but its opposite, that, that is, to lose face, and for the sake of his face, are common. The Chinese concept of face refers to a cultural understanding of respect, honor, and social standing. Actions or words that are disrespectful may cause somebody to lose face, while gifts, awards, and other respect-giving actions may give face. The phrase loose face began life in English as a translation of the Chinese phrase du lien, or something like that. You will pardon my pronunciation as I have absolutely no training in that language whatsoever. The phrase may also be expressed in English as to suffer public disgrace, that is, to be unable to show one's face. In 1876, the consular official, Sir Robert Hart, published a series of essays on the Chinese question, which included the concept of losing face. Save face has no direct equivalent in Chinese and is merely the converse of lose face. The first known record of it in print is in the June 1899 edition of a periodical called Harmsworth Magazine. The social construct is absolutely pivotal in guiding behavior in the Asian cultures I knew a professor at the university who related the following incident. He and his family were staying in Japan at a hotel. At that time, the hotel keys were attached to some large token to avoid their being misplaced. There was a slot at the desk where the lodgers could return those keys, and the professor decided to let his three-year-old accomplish this task putting an item the child could easily manipulate into an oversized hole that had been made especially for that item. The professor told us how the local Japanese looked on in horror that he would let a child possibly experience the failure of this task and thus lose face. Our face says a great deal about what is going on inside of us, how we feel and what we are thinking. When we are too ashamed of what has happened, we lose face. We don't want to be seen by anyone. When we are angry, our eyes burn and our nostrils flare. When things are going well, we can easily smile. 
I come from a particular ethnic group where there exists a limited number of family names and personal given names. For one thing, family names were not required in parts of Europe until the early to mid-19th century. Before that, we were just son or daughter of our father's first name, and many of our given names were Bible heroes and heroines. When people were forced to take family names, they chose from the names related to their jobs, to their geographical locations, or they simply took the names of the other people groups around them. They also developed names which included their patronymic, that is their father's given name, such names that actually end in the syllable son in the Germanic languages. In Russian, that final syllable is of, like Gorbachev, or Ova for a woman, like Anna Pavlova, the famous ballerina, or sometimes the final syllable is itch, as in Ivan Ilyich. In Polish, it is wits or ski. In Spanish, the suffix is either easy or es. In the Celtic cultures, there are prefixes, mac, fitz, or simply o, which is all to explain how I wound up with two great aunts with the same name, Sarah Edelstein, one on each side of my family. On my mother's side, my grandmother's maiden name was Edelstein, which means precious stone. Where exactly the family came from remains a mystery. Apparently, my grandmother used to complain that all of her records were missing from the time that she was, she was a child trying to enter school. Honestly, my mother's parents didn't talk about Europe much. It was just some place to run away from. Anyway, my grandmother had a brother named Nat, and he married a woman named Sarah, so she was one Sarah Edelstein. My grandmother also had a brother named David, and the three families lived on the same block in Queens, New York, very close to the beach. If you have ever seen the 1990 movie Avalon with Aidan Quinn, and I do recommend it, you will get the picture. We saw my mother's family much more often than my father's, as they were more religious and quite a bit more social. And my Uncle Dave told us about Richard Feynman, the well-known physicist, as a student in the high school English class that Uncle Dave taught. Uncle Dave called him King Richard. As for where this Sarah came from, it is anybody's guess. Perhaps her grandchildren knew, but I am not in touch with them. She was our oldest relative on that side, and when it came to the four questions at Passover, she always had the honor of reciting them, a family tradition. The second Sarah was a sister to my grandfather on my father's side. The family came from a place in Poland called Visegrad, and they were nine siblings altogether. I guess she had married earlier and had her children, and then her husband passed away. All of this is ancient history, and the only reason I know any of it is because there is someone who appears to be what is my third cousin, which means that our great-grandfathers were brothers. In that generation, they changed the spelling of the name, so we were hidden from each other for a long time. My third cousin has spent many years researching the family genealogy, and about ten years ago, he found and contacted our side. Oddly enough, he has a sister who lives one town away from me, but I have never met her. Anyway, this Sarah remarried in Edelstein after her first husband died. I don't know whether there was anyone who at that time looked into whether the new husband was related to my mother's family. My father was the kind of person who would have looked, and I think if anything had come out, we would have heard about it. It was just a case of common first and last names, common to our culture. I barely ever saw my Aunt Sarah on my father's side, but I remember the last the last time I did see her. There was a party for something at my parents' house, maybe in the mid-1980s. She was in a wheelchair, probably in her late 80s, and she said something to me that I have not forgotten. She said that it was good to see me with a smile on my face because I used to be such a sourpuss. I was surprised because I was not aware how much she even knew me out of the few times that we had ever met, but I guess my cynical view of life could be read on my face in those days. I wish I could say that the change in my countenance had come because I had come to faith, but that was still a few years in the future. I know that she passed in May of 1987, and I came to faith in December of 1988. That journey for me had begun in childhood. For as long as I can remember, I had wanted to know who God was, and believe me, I looked everywhere. 
In the end, he was ever so faithful to pursue me until I stopped long enough to surrender. I would like to think, when I last saw Aunt Sarah, I was on my way there, that Jehovah had somehow already impacted me, and that it had begun to show the salvation of my countenance. Oh, I so downcast, oh, my soul, put your hope in God. Oh, I so downcast, oh, my soul, put your hope in God. Put your hope in God.